Welcome to our virtual Constitution Day of 2020. And um, you're in the, the keynote session on women's suffrage with um, our distinguished speaker, Ellen, Professor Ellen Carroll Du Bois, um, who is one of the primary historians writing on suffrage today. Just an extraordinary career um, exploring women's suffrage in the United States. She's Distinguished Research Professor Emerita of History at UCLA. And her most recent book, um, there are far too many to list, right, in a very short introduction, is, ent is entitled Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote, which was just, just released this year and is fantastic. Yes, Ellen is showing it to you in her little um, thumbnail, thumbnail portrait, yes. Um, she's also co-authored with Lynn Dumanel of the leading textbook in U.S. women's history, Through Women's Eyes, and editor with Vicki Ruiz of Unequal Sisters, an inclusive reader in U.S. women's history. Take it away, Professor Du Bois. Okay, so I think what we're going to do here is I'm going to give a 40 to 45 minute lecture. Uh, I call it uh, Four Surprises About Women's Suffrage, and it's my effort to cover the whole long period, the whole 75 years of the suffrage movement, with an emphasis on some things that might not be so obvious to the people watching. So, surprise number one, the woman's suffrage constitutional amendment that never was. Um, this is an amendment uh, that came out of the suffrage movement in the early 1870s uh, and was never established, but it would have made a fundamental difference, not just in women's suffrage, but in voting rights for all Americans. So that's a sort of heads up, and now I will begin the story. Um, the story begins on election day, 1872, when hundreds of women around the country went to their local polling places and told the, the uh, as you can see here, the sort of guy who's going, what? Um, told their local polling uh, officers that they were voters. They then attempted to submit, to put their ballots in those boxes that you can see. And these were women from all over the country. We're gonna focus in a minute on New York, but there were women in Santa Cruz in the Santa Clara Valley who did the most famous of these women was the most famous suffragist in the United States, Susan B. Anthony. Here is an image from the time uh, portraying her as a sort of mannish looking female Uncle Tom, which sort of cut, um, Uncle Tom, Uncle Sam, which sort of cuts both ways. She's uh, an icon of American democracy, and yet she's, you know, not a very attractive woman in this image. Um, Anthony uh, joined these other uh, uh, voting women, as I call them, and went to her polling place in Rochester, New York, uh, and um, told the, the uh, polling officer that she believed she had the right to submit her ballot. Now, this was the case that she made. It was based largely on the recently uh, 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 ratified 14th Amendment. Uh, now I would say arguably um, the most important element of the United States Constitution, and particularly the first sentence, which did for the first time something that had never been done. It established a definition of national citizenship. Anthony's argument was, um, although I am a woman, I am a person, uh, and therefore I am a citizen of the United States. Here she's following the first sentence. Um, therefore, like all other citizens, I enjoy equal protection under federal law. All of this was uncontroversial. And then came the crucial part of her case. The right to vote, she said, clearly is one of the foremost privileges uh, of national citizenship. What else does it mean to be a citizen except that you can vote? I am, by virtue of being a U.S. citizen, a voter protected in my political rights. Amazingly, the man let her put her vote in the box, probably because he was a Republican and she was voting for Grant. So, you know, that's okay with him. Um, but a few days after she voted and was thrilled, um, she was arrested for illegal voting, of one of the few federal crimes on the books. 
and a law that had been established uh, particularly against um, former Confederate uh, officers, um, uh, saying that they were not allowed uh, to um, engage in voting if they knew it to be a crime. Um, she uh, was uh, tried in a federal court. Uh, there weren't many federal courts and uh, cases at this time. And so the person who, um, the justice who oversaw her case was actually the newest member of the United States Supreme Court. His name was Ward Hunt. He conducted the trial in a very controversial way. Most importantly, when it came time for the jury which Anthony had done her best to educate the entire voting population of Monroe County in New York. Uh, the jury um, uh, was told by the judge that they needn't come to a decision that he would decide for them because the case turned in his judgment on only two facts. Was the um, accused a woman and did she vote? Uh, and nothing else about her case was she allowed to enter. Um, moreover, um, he made it impossible for her to appeal her case, and this was a terrible, terrible disappointment to her, because the plan had been to take this argument that you see in front of you to the United States Supreme Court, which would hopefully say, absolutely, that's right, and it would obviate the need for an, uh, a constitutional amendment. So uh, here is the United States Supreme Court in these years. What do you see? Uh, all right. The person who brought uh, this case before the court uh, was a woman named Virginia Miner. She was uh, from uh, St. Louis. Um, and um, the case that went before the court, this other name, Happer said, is the name of the guy who's sort of holding his hands up like, what? He, he's the guy who uh, rejected her, her um, ballot. If you're in law school, this is one of the first two cases in women's rights you ever learn about. The court ruled in Minor versus Happerset uh, that women were persons and therefore they were citizens and that their rights and privileges were protected under federal law, but, and here's the quote here, uh, the right of suffrage was not one of the privileges or immunities of national citizenship. Uh, and um, so the Constitution, uh, uh, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution did not make women, or anyone else for that matter, voters. Voting was still under the purview of the states, as it had been established originally in the original Constitution. Um, now, let's jump ahead for a minute, um, because the fact that... Um, this effort and a subsequent effort on the part of suffragists to establish the link between national citizenship and the right to vote uh, failed uh, has put us in the position that we suffer today, which is uh, that's what we call voter suppression. It has to do with the fact that the states have full and unlimited, and now with the uh, sort of um, dismantling of the Voting Rights Act, no federal oversight over uh, their voting. They can, as Ward Hunt said at one point, if a state wants to say that anybody with gray hair can't vote, they can do it, which is very terrifying to all of us el elderly folks. Um, uh, suffragists weren't daunted. Um, so at this point, uh, uh, with the Supreme Court uh, ruling against them, they decided to propose a constitutional amendment based on these very same principles. And this is the amendment that never was. So here is, here is Elizabeth Stanton standing in front of the House Judiciary Committee um, uh, proposing her amendment. And here is the amendment. The right of suffrage in the United States shall be based on citizenship. This was the point. Shall be regulated by Congress and all citizens, whether native or naturalized, shall enjoy this right equally. And then the final fra phrase, which indicates the women's rights dimension, without any adding, even though in some ways it wasn't necessary, without any distinction or discrimination, whatever founded on uh, sex. But by now it was 19, 1878, uh, the uh, ruling party was uh, uh, fully uh, exhausted with constitutional amending, no longer interested, no other constitutional amendment was added 
to the United States Constitution until the 16th Amendment in the 19th. Um, or, um, uh, and instead, um, the suffragists uh, had to default to the amendment, they had to leave behind the amendment that never was, the universal suffrage amendment, and default to the amendment that became the 19th Amendment. That's the language at the bottom of the screen. At the time, had it been uh, adopted at that time, it would have been the 16th Amendment. Um, so I just want to point out uh, the differences between these two. Um, the, uh, the most obvious one is that the universal suffrage version that never was is posed in the affirmative. Suffrage is based on national citizenship. The one, woman's suffrage amendment that was finally ratified, which is exactly uh, um, uh, patterned on the 15th Amendment with only changes on the words after on account of, um, does not shift the location of the right to vote to the federal government. It just says that states are not allowed to do one thing, which is to discriminate against women. Um, I should say that um, the 15th Amendment, which as I say is very similar, and says that no state shall uh, be allowed to uh, deny the vote on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Um, the Southern states, as they um, ditched their reconstruction um, um, uh, um, uh, politics, um, uh, figured out that they could deny former slave men the right to vote on things that were they call, that were basically surrogates for race. So they said, if your father, if your grandfather hadn't voted, then you couldn't vote, or if you couldn't um, interpret the Constitution in a way that was satisfactory to the election officer, you couldn't vote. And the Supreme Court allowed all of this, or if you couldn't pay the poll tax, you couldn't vote. And all of these were forms of voter discrimination by race. Um, so I will, before I leave this first, um, so, so again, to repeat what I said earlier, um, we, uh, uh, it was a very unlikely uh, amendment to have passed at a time when uh, constitutional amending had developed rather a sour taste, uh, but we would be in a, a very different position now and we would have, as this young girl asks us to have, <coughs> universal suffrage. Okay, the other implication of the, of the failure of the woman's suffrage amendment that never was has to do with race. Uh, this is an image probably from about 1910, the Crisis magazine, uh, which was the magazine of, um, of the NAACP. And uh, we have here a white woman uh, putting her hand up against a black woman. They both hold signs for votes for women. The cartoon is uh, labeled just like the men votes for white women. By leaving this universal suffrage approach behind, the woman suffrage movement uh, abandoned its abolitionist heritage and became a much less diverse, much whiter, a much more white dominated movement and remained so for the rest of the 50 year history of this movement. Now, what was going on in the suffrage movement wasn't it alone. The entire country was descending uh, into a period of uh, racial reaction and violence. We know it as the Jim Crow era. Uh, but for our, our purposes, what is important is that white suffragists adapted to this new atmosphere uh, and mainstream suffrage organizations no longer uh, and, uh, welcome black women. Um, nonetheless, black women not only continued to fight for women's suffrage, but as their resources, their education, and their political uh, knowledge increased towards the end of the century, they became more and more organized and fought um, for uh, women's suffrage in their own segregated organizations. Uh, so the woman on the uh, far left and far right are from the earlier period, 60s and 70s, 
And the woman in the middle who's from Boston is from the 80s and the 90s. The mainstream suffrage movement, the white dominated suffrage movement, so we're talking really about sort of two suffrage segregated movements. The mainstream suffrage movement, the white dominated movement's reputation for racial exclusivity and at times outright racism uh, uh, tainted and continues to taint its historical legacy. And I expect this is one of the things we'll talk about in our discussion. So that's the first surprise. Here comes the second surprise. Uh, growing the base the role of the woman's Christian temperance union last quarter of the 19th century. Uh, Elizabeth Stanton uh, characterized these years after the uh, Minor versus Happersett decision as uh, the constitutional door slamming shut. Uh, and uh, in these years, uh, suffragists focused on building their base, as we would put it on making the demand for voting rights meaningful to the average woman. Now, I use this very conventional image. In the late 19th century, the female face, not the population, the female face of America was that of a small town, white, Protestant, church-going wife and mother. She was pious, she was domestic, and she was maternal. She was focused on the welfare of her family, waiting with open arms for her, um, her husband to bring home the bacon. She owned no property and paid no taxes and cared little for the political issues that rocked presidential elections. So what this meant is that the kinds of claims for women's suffrage that uh, pioneering suffragists like Stanton and Anthony had focused on universal justice and equal rights offered little appeal to her. How might such a woman, how might the majority of women come to understand the importance and power of women's suffrage? The woman's suffrage uh, demand was first connected to the daily lives of large numbers of these, let's call them conventional women, not by radicals like Susan B. Anthony, but by the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Now, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, formed in 1874, uh, is ridiculed in public memory as a bunch of axe-wielding prohibitionists, grim-faced women who only want to deny men their few privileges uh, as they seek to escape uh, the ball and, old ball and chain um, uh, at home. Um, actually, the WCTU was quickly becoming the largest women's association in the late 19th century. Women were drawn to the women's, to the temperance movement and to the women's temperance movement in particular, initially because of its focus on what um, men's drinking did to impoverish families and how it subjected uh, women and children to domestic abuse, to physical abuse. And we can see this going on in this image. Oddly enough, the man has the physiognomy, uh, a classic that anybody in the 19th century would recognize as Irish, his little upturned nose, uh, whereas she looks like somebody right out of a, a women's magazine, a, a, a kindly uh, waspy woman. Um, uh, with this as its background, um, about a decade after it was formed, the WCTU, um, uh, became the first large organization outside of the suffrage societies, which weren't very large, to fight for voting rights for women. This was three decades before similar secular organizations uh, um, uh, supported suffrage. This, these images are those of the woman who was responsible for this really quite extraordinary development. Frances Willard was the most revered woman of the late 19th century. Um, we barely, most of us barely know of her now. Um, Willard, um, oh yeah, I have to tell you about the picture. I love this picture, uh, the one on the right. Um, so um, I forgot to look, oh, there's her date, 1839. So probably in this image, she's probably about 40, 40 years old or something like that. 
Now, bicycle riding by this time, by the 1880s, was the cool thing for modern women to do. It allowed them, it was very athletic, um, and it allowed them to go about, really have a lot of freedom of movement. And so Frances Willard decided, although clearly it made her somewhat uncomfortable, um, to learn how to ride a bike. Now, when we learned how to ride bikes, our fathers held the back of the bikes for us. Here, these two younger women pulled her up. And she wrote a little, little book called How I Learned to Ride the Bicycle. Okay, now Willard approached woman suffrage in a very different way than Susan B. Anthony. Not as an issue of abstract justice or equal rights with men. Women, she argued, do not, must not, need not have the vote because they, were this, they had the same capacities and the same rights and the same obligations as men but because their obligations and their spheres were so fundamentally different. Her argument was that women needed to go out into the political world to protect their domestic sphere, their families and their homes. She captured this argument by basically rebranding uh, uh, votes for women. The term women suffrage had already uh, developed quite a um, radical reputation um, and she called it, she recalled it the home protection ballot. Um, and I use this image um, to show that uh, the brilliance of her approach was that it was vaulting these conventional Gilded Age women over the alleged wall separating the private sphere from the public, women's sphere from men's sphere, women's boring interests in fashion and gossip, for the larger world. Uh, Willard died rather young in the 1890s, but the approach that she took uh, gained a modernized version in the, 19, in the early 20th century. Uh, that approach was that vote was a tool, was not just a principle, but a tool that would allow women to uh, address political issues that they uniquely cared about. Uh, and we can see that even this sort of emphasis on women as uh, domestic uh, characterizes this 20th century image from San Francisco. Um, so here, the suffragist, you can see it's a little more modern, you can see her ankles, um, is cleaning up the muck on the ground. But here you see what the muck is. It is food adulteration white slavery, otherwise known as trafficking in women, bribery and graft. Um, and uh, the tool that she's using to clean up this dirt and clean up politics is the ballot. Um, the, uh, this approach appealed to a new, uh, new um, generation of women, uh, more urban, more Catholic and Jewish, less Protestant, more foreign born, and more wage earning uh, as they sought to use the vote to address issues with which women in particular were concerned. Factory working conditions as on the right, urban, urban living conditions. <clears throat> this is an incredible image by, I believe, Jacob Reese, uh, a very famous image of uh, children probably on the Lower East Side of New York playing around a dead horse. Uh, and perhaps the most important issue to um, politically minded women of these years of the early 20th century, and that was child labor. So that's the second surprise. Okay, we're moving ahead. We're now in the early 20th century. Uh, and this is the third surprise. Many women, uh, uh, now I know that my, um, my panel here, this is no surprise to them because they're specialists in California suffrage. But many, many uh, um, people who admire the suffrage movement and know a bit about it are unaware of how many women had full voting rights prior to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So um, let us remember uh, the point made earlier, which was the constitutional door had slammed shut and uh, the right to vote was being controlled by the states as the con original constitution had uh, wished it to be. As a result, suffragists, unable to make any gains in the, uh, in, 
at the federal level in the United States Constitution turned their sights to the states and to getting voting rights in the separate states. Um, I want to emphasize here um, something that's hard to keep in our heads, which is when they succeeded at doing this, the women who gained voting rights didn't just gain state voting rights. They didn't just gain the right to vote for their legislators. They gained full, full voting rights all the way up to and including uh, voting for president. Now, this is an image of women voting in Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming, many people, to the degree that they know women voted early, they think of Wyoming as a place where women voted. And they usually take the date as 1869. But in 1869, Wyoming was a territory. And nobody, the citizens of the territory, could only vote for territorial legislators. Um, uh, it, it wasn't much of a ballot. Um, which moves us on to the first state uh, where, uh, where suffragists put the issue of votes for women on the ballot as a referendum and were able to convince male voters to change the state constitution to include women's right to vote. And that state is Colorado. It was seven times as large as Wyoming, <clears throat> and it was a, a, more, a much more economically important and diverse state. Uh, this picture, I, another picture I just love. So um, uh, the Constitution is changed in 1893 by the men of Colorado who are very much influenced by the populist movement and think their women are going to help them make, uh, ch make reform changes. And I love this because these two women are like, yeah, try and stop me from voting. I got my best hat on and that's that. Um, here is an image of one of the suffragists of the Colorado campaign. Her name was Elizabeth Ensley. She was, as you can see, African-American. Uh, she was a leader of the Denver, Denver Black community, a veteran of the Howard University faculty, and eventually treasurer of the college, the Colorado Women's Suffrage Association. So by the time the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, women like Elizabeth Ensley had voted for United States president six times. Now this brings us to our beloved home state of California. In 1911, California became the sixth and by far the most important state. It was the 12th largest in the United States at this point to amend its state constitution to give women full voting rights. The California uh, campaign was the first truly modern campaign, 20th century campaign, a modern political effort uh, of the women's suffrage movement. Uh, it involved uh, a, a different kind, a, a, a coalition of, suff of women behind suffrage, but a very different coalition than those WCT years. First of all, there is a different kind of class structure uh, and uh, here are the two most important groups. Uh, college graduates. I think by this time, the University of California was the source of the largest number of women uh, with BAs in the United States. And wage earners. Uh, and this was the work of Francis Noel in uh, Los Angeles. Um, in addition um, to this class diversity, there's also a, a racial diversity to observe. Um, in uh, California, um, um, this is work that I think is just beginning to be done. There were, um, yeah, there were some black suffragists. This woman, Hetty Tilgman, was from Oakland. She was uh, the head of something called the Fanny Coppin Club in Oakland. But uh, these other two groups, I think, deserve real attention. On the left is Maria de Lopez. She is the only Spanish-speaking suffrage leader that we know about. She was from the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, she's a fascinating figure. I hope to write about her, so you're going to have to wait to find out more about her. And then, of course, there were Asian women, particularly Chinese women. Now, um, because of uh, laws prohibiting uh, both interracial marriage and uh, 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 Chinese um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, there were very few 
native born uh, Chinese people uh, of this generation of, uh, this is, we're in 1911, and so not many women. Uh, but there was a lot of attention in the California suffrage movement to trying to get those Chinese men who did have the right to vote, who'd been born in this country, uh, to support the amendment. And they may have done it also for, um, for the appearance of racial diversity. In any case, there are at least two different um, candidates for the, quote, first um, uh, Asian woman to vote in, um, in California. This woman, Clara Chan Lee, uh, is actually shown voting. But there's another picture of uh, the well-known Tai Lung Schultz, uh, who was um, an activist about uh, rescuing uh, Chinese women from uh, prostitution. Okay. Um, uh, so I've talked about the diversity of the, of the, of the, uh, the demographics of the movement. It's also the case that the movement employed a lots of modern technology. It employed, it employed telephones, movie theaters. This image on the right is of a uh, sort of a melodrama about suffrage of which there were a fair number. And almost all of them usually have featured uh, a real suffragist, um, you know, seeming to deliver a speech. Of course, they were silent movies, so they had to put the speech on, on, on uh, couldn't hear her. Uh, and then a lot of use of automobiles. We were already an automobile state uh, and um, women used automobiles to leave the big cities where they were concentrated and go out into the smaller towns. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they would drive or sometimes they would be driven by their, this woman, this one looks like a woman's driving it. Sometimes their male chauffeurs would drive them. Um, they would drive out to the central squares of a small, small village uh, probably lunchtime, <clears throat> and they would pull up, and one, and they both, uh, women would stand on the, you can see them, they're standing on, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the car floor, and one woman would use a trumpet to call people to listen, and then the other woman would give a, a suffrage stump speech, uh, usually to men on their lunch hour, and often, at least at the beginning, to a lot of heckling, um, but usually they won over their, uh, the people who watched them. One final image from the California movement. Um, <clears throat> these elegant graphics, which were so much uh, an aspect of the California movement, uh, show its modern character and its determination to uh, break out of that old, um, think back to that image of Susan B. Anthony, mannish Susan B. Anthony, and here we have a glamorous, modern, fashionable woman. Her hair is short. She's wearing a kind of folkloric outfit. And she's standing in front of, that's actually the Golden Gate, except there's no Golden Gate there. I mean, it's the Golden Gate. There's no bridge yet. But in franchising women state by state, which had a lot of uh, success, West, West in the West, uh, could never succeed in... Um, uh, enfranchising all the women of the United States. In particular, the southern, the southeastern states, the states of the former Confederacy, were, the Jim Crow South was uh, determined uh, never to allow any federal intrusion into the franchise, having worked very hard to get black men out of their rights to vote. Um, and the Jim Crow South was an absolute barrier to winning the right to vote at the state level, and as we'll see, almost in defeating it at the federal level. So we see here um, another image from this period, another anti, it's a racist image, but it's also an image against suffrage. Uh, if, if you want women's suffrage, this is what you're gonna get. These mannish women with, you know, these stereotypical uh, black faces, they're wearing men's hats and men's shoes, they're barely women. Um, I, I believe that the uh, incredible determination of um, the southern states and their national manifestations, which we'll get to in a minute, um, to, to bar women's suffrage, uh, lest black women get the right to vote, is uh, happened in direct proportion 
to um, the growing involvement of black women in via their own organizations in the um, in the suffrage movement. Um, so here is uh, the California State Friend Federation of Colored Women's Clubs in 1915, Oakland. Uh, and then here on the right is the most famous and boldest uh, uh, African-American woman in the United States at the turn of the century. And this is Ida B. Wells, later Ida B. Wells Barnett, um, the first great champion of attacking uh, the lynching epidemic. Um, so because of this barrier uh, to winning the right to vote for all women state by state, not to mention how much work it was going to be, um, how are we doing? Well, we're going to be a little 10 minutes over. You'll forgive me, I hope. Or not? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, the uh, now suffragists had to return to a national strategy, an amendment to the federal constitution. By, but now, by the middle of the 1910s, suffrage have a new tool. Women in all of those white states, those white colored states west of the Mississippi, have the right to vote, including for president. And they themselves can be a tool to force the federal government to change its tune. By 1916, 14% of the nation's women were already voting for president. Now, as I think certainly my panel knows, a, a small breakaway suffrage branch named the National Women's Party uh, determined in 1916 to go west and to urge the, quote, voting women of the free suffrage states to use their votes to deny or to threaten uh, the sitting president of the United States, there's his name, Woodrow Wilson, um, uh, and the party that he stood for, a Democratic party that was still very Southern under the control of Southern Southern states, uh, to, deny, to deny them re-election unless Woodrow Wilson let up his opposition to a federal amendment, which he, as a Southern Democrat, opposed uh, for the reasons that we've discussed. Um, it was a really, uh, it was a, um, it was an energetic campaign, but it's 1916 and it failed. And it failed because the president went to the voters, he was an incumbent, but he also went to the voters and said, re-elect me and I will keep you out of the war. He didn't do that. Um, uh, just uh, two months after he was re-inaugurated, the United States went to war. At that point, the National Women's Party um, shifts its tactic and begins to use nonviolent protest methods against the president, becoming the first protest movement to picket the White House. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's the one part of the suffrage history that almost everybody knows a little bit about because these women are so incredible. Um, they're very, especially to us, their, 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 their bravery is quite amazing. But I actually think the real source for the change, which comes at the end of 1917, even before the war is over, is that finally, one state east of the Mississippi amends its constitution, and it just happens to be the most populous and most politically powerful state in the Union, and that's New York State. Um, uh, at this point, it's a delegation of something like 47 uh, delegates now <coughs> are obligated to the votes of women. Uh, uh, soon after the November 1917 election, uh, President Wilson changes his tune. Uh, after six years of opposition and publicly comes out in favor of the 19th Amendment. So now we're at finally at the fourth and final surprise. And I call this one, this, I'm going to close the door. I think you maybe can hear uh, uh, gardeners. Sorry about that. Um, this, my, my point here is that there was nothing inevitable about the uh, women's suffrage amendment passing. It could have easily uh, fallen by the wayside like so many other, many thousands of amendments that never get through Congress and uh, dozens of amendments 
that never get through ratification. Um, okay, so let's do this as quickly as we can. In January 1918, just two months after the November 1917 New York victory, the House of Representatives finally agreed to vote on a woman's suffrage amendment. And this meant, I need to be clear about this, they weren't passing an amendment, they were passing a bill to begin the process of ratification. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a lot of January, in 2018, there was a lot of attention. No, January 2018 is when the 19th Amendment was passed. No. Okay, we see here the congressperson who is presenting the uh, bill for a suffrage amendment. And she is a modern woman with a nice bob. And her name is Jeanette Rankin. She's from the state of Montana. And um, Montana was a state where women voted. She herself had uh, worked to uh, amend the Constitution of Montana, and the first vote she ever cast was for herself. Uh, so it's um, I can't go forward. Uh, but it turned out to be very, very difficult to get the second house, the second house of Congress, the Senate to pass the bill by the necessary two-thirds votes. Um, uh, in addition to suffrage, so to Southern state opposition on race grounds, uh, there were conservative Republican senators from states like Connecticut um, and uh, New Hampshire that uh, were determined to keep the amendment bill from passing. Um, it's important to point out here that the Senate was just beginning uh, the 17th Amendment had just been ratified, and it was just beginning to transfer the election of senators to popular vote. Many senators were still being elected uh, by their state legislatures, so they were very far away from the uh, voting public. Um, there's also the war. So we're running from about uh, January 1918 to um, uh, the summer. Uh, June of 1919. There's the war. I wrote about that. And then there's something which I didn't write about in my book because uh, I didn't notice it. And this was the pandemic, the flu pandemic. Uh, many historians don't notice these things until contemporary issues bring them to bear. I wrote a little article on it. Um, Havoc was wrought by the flu. There were three uh, sequences of the flu, just as we can anticipate. Um, in Washington, D.C., in those something like 15 months that, um, that uh, the bill could not get through the Senate, um, uh, both the Speaker of the House and the head of the suffrage movement uh, have the flu, and they're both sort of laid low by it, and an intermediary has to go between them so that they can make plans. The U.S. Public Health Service, which had just been established, called for the cancellation of all large gatherings, which uh, destroys the suffragists' opportunity. But the suffragists have some advantages. They, um, they have, uh, as we can see on this left-hand side, whoops, go backwards. Um, um, they play a major role in health care. So many male doctors were in the uh, were uh, serving the army in Europe that women have a major role in uh, home home uh, front uh, medicine, uh, and it's a great great image of these modern women wearing their masks. Um, they go ahead with uh, campaigns that they had um, planned to defeat the three or four men that were holding them up in the Senate. Um, and get the necessary 64 votes. An especially interesting coalition campaign was, uh, was mobilized successfully against the conservative Republican senator from Massachusetts, John Weeks. Uh, this is a, a card, the, 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 uh, the, the suffrage lobbyists were very sophisticated and they have a whole a card file in which they said absolutely everything they can find out about this guy. And you can see her, Sen Jeanette Rankin is the one who sent in the information about uh, Senator Weeks. They are able to um, defeat him in part because they mobilized the Boston Jewish community 
which was angry at him because he voted against the um, appointment of the first Jew to the United States Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis. Um, no one thought he would lose, but he did. Uh, okay, uh, 15 months after the House vote, the Senate votes, and now we're on to the really tough part, the ratification campaign. They have only 15 months to win ratification in time for women to vote in the 1920 presidential election. Um, and as I said, there was nothing for sure about this. One year after Senate passage in June of, 20, of 1920, 35, or it was probably before that, maybe in the, in the, in the spring, um, 35 states have ratified, but they're still short of one, and it's just not clear where they're going to get it. Here are the states that they weren't going to get. They were having trouble from all of the former Confederacy and uh, New Hampshire and Connecticut. Um, in the end, uh, again, this is one of the few stories that people know about. Victory, the final battle came down to Tennessee, uh, which was a rare Southern state with a Republican Party. Uh, in, uh, in a boiling hot August, um, uh, there was a, a, a down and dirty battle in the Tennessee legislator, legislature. Uh, and on about August 18th, um, the legislature finally uh, passed the bill, I think without any votes to spare. This is the story that everybody knows about. This good looking fellow who's 24 years old uh, was a Republican legislature, legislator from East Tennessee. Uh, legend has it and turns out to be true that his mother told him to vote for uh, Mrs. Cat. He did. Um, and um, uh, so, again, the date's usually wrong. It's not uh, August 18th. It's August 26th, which is when the, the Tennessee ratification made it to the desk of Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State Colby, who signed it first thing in the morning, lest there be any more trouble. There was nobody there to have a picture taken. Uh, and here we have a picture of uh, women celebrating the ratification and I'm done. Okay, stop sharing. And now it's another 75 years, but maybe that's what you'll ask me. About. Sherry, maybe you can unmute everybody. I'm gonna. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. Nope, you went away. You were there for a minute. There, I hear you. How's that? Good for me. Judy, I think you're still muted. Me? Who's muted? Judy, I think. Ah. I was just gonna keep myself muted until I had something I had to say. <laughs> Did you want to direct us, Sherry? Um, well, I thought I would just introduce um, our members of this little round table really briefly, because I didn't do it at the beginning. Um, uh, Zudi Chu Chun Wu is professor of Asian American studies at the University of California, Irvine. Um, much of her work focuses on Asian American women's history and her current book project in collaboration with political scientist Gwendolyn Mink explores the political career of Patsy Takamoto Mink, the first woman of color elected to Congress. Was it 1964, Judy? Yeah. Um, and the co-author, I believe, and namesake of Title IX. Um, really did extraordinary things, and we're looking forward to seeing that. Sue Englander teaches uh, at San Francisco State in History and Women's Studies and at the City College of San Francisco in History, Women's Studies, and Labor and Community Studies. So. Sue wears a lot of hats. Um, as part of her master's thesis, she focused on women's suffrage and especially on Maude Younger, who was a member of the Congressional Union and the National Women's Party. Judy, do you wanna start us off? Thanks so much for inviting me to the conversation and congratulations, Ellen. It's quite a, a feat to write this work. <laughs> And then do such a comprehensive um, lecture about the suffrage movement. So thank you so much for sharing your thank scholarship you with us. Um, I had some questions and maybe I'll begin with those. And then um, I'm happy to you know, 
<laughs> trade off with my co panelists. Um, one thing that struck me in your presentation, you talked about more diverse set of women who were involved in suffrage than I think appeared in your book. And um, one of the things I try to reconcile in thinking about the importance of the 19th Amendment is that you point out there's women who could vote before the 19th, but there are women who continued not to be able to vote after the 19th. Um, and so I think about the um, bans on citizenship, um, which includes Asian immigrants, um, certainly African-American women in the South, think about Native American women and their status as citizens, or the very complicated um, ability of, of Latino women, that they may legally have the right with the Treaty of Guadalupe with Hidalgo, but that maybe in reality, it might have been very difficult to exert the vote. Um, and then there's also the context of US empire, that it's expanding. It has been expanding throughout the 19th century across the continent, but it also expands overseas into the Philippines and Pacific Islands and Caribbean islands. And so I just think about sort of the unevenness of the suffrage victory, if you want to think about it in that way. Um, so I'm just curious about what your thoughts about, about that. Um, you speak in the book in a very celebratory way about how it enfranchises, it doubles enfranchisement, but it doesn't quite do that. And so I'm, I'm curious about how you make sense of that unevenness of, of um, suffrage. Um, well, I want to point out that there were various efforts to constrain the 19th Amendment and to put a racial limitation on it, and those were defeated. So the 19th Amendment has no limitations placed on it, except those limitations which are in the structure of the United States Constitution, which leave the right to vote under the control of the state. These are not the responsibility of the suffragists themselves. Um, so, um, uh, Some of those restrictions were also federal restrictions, though. No, well, yeah, the, the Native American restriction, uh, the restriction of Native Americans, and the, res yes, but I mean, uh, particularly the problems with African Americans, those, those restrictions were at the state level, and they were, they, were, um, they were mobilized by white supremacist states in the Southeast. Uh, n n there are no federal limitations. There's a weak federal Supreme Court, but there are no federal legal limitations for African Americans. Um, you know, it's not clear to me what suffragists could have done other than what they did. I mean, it is certainly true that um, some of the most uh, noted leaders of the 20th century suffrage movement were not supporters of racial equality, and that's Alice Paul and Carrie Catt both. Uh, and they could have used their movement, especially after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, you know, the 19th Amendment has um, uh, a, uh, the second article says that you can pass federal legislation to enact it. And um, that could have happened, and they didn't do that. Uh, and that, I think, is on them. Um, uh, so I'm not sure prior to 1920 what they could have done. Um, the ban for Native Americans is for men and women both. Um, when that law changes in 1924, men and women both are able to vote because of the 19th Amendment. Um, uh, the, as you know, the ban on, uh, on um, citizenship for naturalized Asian citizens uh, obtains for both men and women both, although for various reasons it impacts women uh, more severely. Um, so, uh, now, it is, all, it is the case also that um, the American colonies, particularly the Philippines and Puerto Rico, um, do not get to enjoy the benefits of the 19th Amendment. And again, this is on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in its insular, what are called the insular cases, makes the decision. I'm not sure if it has to do with suffrage or with other issues. But basically, it says the United States Constitution does not apply to American colonies. And so uh, the Puerto Rican uh, women's movement in 1920, so what is it, 1926? This is uh, 
uh, Becky's, uh, no, um, um, uh, Allison Snyder? Allison's work, yes. I think 1926. And um, the, uh, uh, the Philippines in 1944 have their own movements, women's suffrage movements. Um, so um, it is certainly the case. Uh, let me address it in one other way. Um, The, um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment is being celebrated at a national level in a uniquely apolitical way. Um, the uh, Congress has instituted a centennial commission. Uh, most of its leaders are appointed by the uh, Trump administration and the Republican Congress. Um, and they approach this as um, really in totally different than the way I approached it. It's something that was inevitable. That's a celebration of American democracy. Um, um, one of my favorite examples of this is that this commission is establishing state subcommissions everywhere. And they're very happy to establish a state subcommission in Mississippi, which did not ratify the 19th Amendment until 1973. So, um, uh, you know, this is just draining you know, it's funny that they should do so because actually the Republican Party historically has more of a role in suffrage, but I don't think they know this. Uh, and um, uh, so they have just sort of drained this movement of all of its history, all of its politics. Um, well, I guess I haven't gotten to the point I want to make, which is that the battle for the right to vote it has not, is not something that is... Um, I'll use it for all the San Francisco State faculty. It's not something that was reified in 1920. It's not a thing. Uh, it is a struggle. It is a struggle that the leaders, uh, many of the leaders, they're mostly talking about uh, women uh, struggling to get elected to public office. But the leaders recognize this is just really the beginning uh, as, uh, I don't know, Somebody said, now we can begin. Um, so um, the campaign for women's suffrage, so the, we can see an after story, as I wrote about in the book, uh, in many ways, but especially in the uh, long, slow struggle of women to get elected to national office. Um, and uh, also, um, the historian of black suffrage, Martha, Tom, Martha Jones, whose book is not out yet, um, has made the argument, I think, a good argument, that the term suffrage is such an antiquated term. It, it doesn't even make sense. It didn't even make sense in 1920. They didn't use it. Um, that even if we use something like votes for women, we can begin to connect what happened in 1920 with the struggles that we still have today. And the struggles against voter suppression are, interestingly enough, being conducted by or led by women. Stacey Abrams, and also the League of Women Voters has played a major role in this. So I hope that's the beginning of an answer to your important question. Thank you. I'll pass this off to my colleagues. I just wanted to share something. I'm editing Women in Social Movements, and we have a collection, a roundtable that's coming out soon of curators who have been commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, and to ask them, how do you tell complex stories about suffrage to a popular oh, audience? How do you tell a story through objects? And one of our curators, um, Theo Tyson, I thought she said something very interesting. She, her collection, I think, has the anti before suffrage. And she's not just pointing out that there was a suffrage and an anti-suffrage movement, but that suffragists themselves were anti-suffrage against other women. <laughs> Right, they only want certain women to vote. So I thought that was a very interesting, clever formulation um, to think about how the anti is embedded within the suffrage movement. Um, Judy, why don't you also say something about the incredible Black suffrage uh, project at uh, WASMU? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So Tom Dublin, Kitty Sklar have been um, what is that term? But they've been they've been working with people around uh, dig it in the dirt. They they yes. really I think they call it crowdsourcing. Yes, that's what it is. Right? They're they're tapping faculty students around the country to develop encyclopedia entries of Black women suffragists. 
So and they it's something like 400 now? I can't keep track, but they have this incredible collection. And these are people who, you know, they've scoured the documents, found names and emails them the names, but they have been able to restore. This is another charge one can make against um, the suffrage movement that its historical account really short cites uh, African-American women. And uh, uh, they have been able to return those hundreds of women to the history of the suffrage movement. I have a question related to that, but let me pass this off to my colleagues and um, if there's more time at the end, I'll come back to it. Okay, Sue, do you want to ask Ellen? Yeah, um, am, I, am I unmuted? Okay, You're unmuted. great. Um, you know, I, I've been looking at um, Jacqueline Dowd Hall and her formulation of civil, the long civil rights movement. And, and there's, there's certainly criticism uh, for instance, that it really doesn't include things like the Black Panthers and other, the Young Lords, you know, but um, I really do think that there's also the long uh, suffrage movement. And so, for instance, last week, the Supreme Court denied the right of felons in Florida to be able to vote unless they had paid all of their court fees. And a felon. all of them, mm -hmm. a former felon. Former felons, yes, former felons. And so when you looked at the images of felons, it was all men. Now, I can't believe, you know, that there is such a homogeneous group of felons, uh, former felons in the state of Florida. I certainly can believe that they can't pay what is now a poll tax. But um, it seems as though, you know, the, the wave of suffrage surges and then pulls back. And so um, I'm looking at that. What do, you, what do you think about that as a way to view suffrage and the fact that it's still, it's still a thing, you know, because we have to revive Section 5 of the Voting Rights? Uh, well, I was trying to indicate that. I think that's right. I think that the uh, campaign against voter suppression is usefully attached to the suffrage movement as a later day suffrage movement. I do think, though, although we can find women felons, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, carceral state, uh, and it's hard for uh, we feminists to uh, face this, but the carceral state really comes down on men much harder than it does on women. Uh, and uh, although we can find women in the prisons, it's the men, the enormous portion, of, certainly in the African-American community of men, whose lives are taken away from them. It's interesting though, that I think women are leading the movement. Uh, it's a little bit like, um, it's almost like um, uh, Ida, B. Ida B. Wells and the National Association of Colored Women leading the anti-lynching movement. Even though there were women victims of lynching, the majority of victims were men, and yet women lead the campaign. Um, perhaps because they have a full-fledged appreciation. Let me, let me back up for a minute. We could look a little closer. I wouldn't be surprised if we knew the details of the Florida govern, or the Georgia governor election that Stacey Abrams wasn't um, um, uh, subjected to uh, sexist attacks. Um, we certainly see that uh, in this presidential um, campaign, uh, obviously on the Republican side, with the misogynist in chief. But on the Democratic side, that, you know, one third of those candidates were incredibly talented women, and yet they fell way, one by one, uh, uh, the victim of attitudes about what constitutes leadership that were manifestly sexist in their qualities. So that's what I would say. You know, I was gonna pick up one other thing. When you were talking about the long civil rights movement, I make a point early in the book that every political movement in the Gilded Age and in the Progressive Era, including Black rights, was, uh, was racially conservative, if not discriminatory. And yet it's only the suffrage movement that takes such a hard hit for this. Um, and I think that that's very interesting. I think there is still a sense that um, women have to be 
pristine in their politics and that they're easily criticized. Um, I guess I've spent too much of my life as a suffrage historian not to be defensive on their part. Oh, by the way, uh, what do you call this? Uh, when you make a, a statement of what is true, I was Sue's, Sue's teacher and I was also, I guess Sherry's teacher a little bit, right? Or not at all, just Sue's, Sherry's and Sue's. So uh, uh, what do you call that when you say, you know, you, you tell what's, you say, you know, you, you acknowledge things that uh, compromise people's uh, uh, autonomy of judgment. What? Anyway. Selling out, or I, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what you mean. I remember what the term is. You know, you say, before I speak, I have to say that this person actually. You're accusing yourself. No, not that's not it. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I get my question. Just as, a, just as a, a tag to that, you know, I also think that it's important to complicate social movements and um, to acknowledge you know the fact that you know they are flawed and i mean you can't you can't parade any social movement as 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 you say totally pure um given you know what dynamics are taking place in any historical movement so you know i'm fine with um these uh these uh you know facts coming out about the, the suffrage movement however I also think, you know, that we still live in that world that complicates every political issue that we deal with. Yeah, I want to, yeah, let me, let me pick up that on that too, which is that um, uh, we need to have a certain kind of humility about our own historical position. Uh, we need, when we make these judgments about people in the past, we need to recognize that they don't live when we live. And, you know, in 75 or 100 years from now, people are going to look at us and say, those idiots, they kept driving their cars, even though they knew that they were destroying the planet. And they will look at us and see that we were thoughtless abusers of our planet. And we're just doing our best in our own terms. So, as I say, uh, uh, you know what, we need to whatever judgments we make about people in the past, we need to do our best to look at our own selves and be as insightful as we can about what our own barriers to clear, to clear judgment are in our own world. Okay. Can I just make a comment? I think we should absolutely historically contextualize, but I think we should also acknowledge when certain suffrage leaders used race, used whiteness, used the U.S. empire as a strategy to advance suffrage for a particular population. And so it's not just they reflect the values of that time, but they utilize certain politics to advance certain political interests. So I think that is part of um, the historical recognition, historical analysis, historical reckoning of the suffrage movement. I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. It's a big struggle. I'm about to write a biography of Elizabeth Stanton, and it's a big struggle in dealing with her. Although she's got 50 years of a, of a reputation, and it all boils down to two years in the late, 19, in the late 1860s, and that whole long history um, sort of falls by the wayside in that moment. So this, this sort of continues this discussion about, about race, but also um, we can think about uh, ideas about class difference and cultural difference, et cetera. But it seems like there was, there, were, there was both a lot of prejudice in the suffrage movement and the strategic use of racism, particularly in dealing with the national situation. But there was also a lot of it, it seems to me kind of extraordinary coalition building at the same time. So it's, it's, it's very paradoxical to me in that way. Um, I, I think those are all, go ahead. Did I stop you? No, just in terms of, you know, the, the, the diversity um, in California, but in other places um, could be quite extraordinary or, you know, the suffrage movement could at times um, push separatism and, um, what, what was the distinction you made between strategy and what was the other word you used? Strategy and 
sort of um, belief systems, really. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, a very, very good point. First of all, I want to start by something that sort of comes up certainly from your work, which is we pay so much attention attention to race. We pay very little attention, well, to class and more and more to the point to ethnicity. That is to say, white immigrants are, we, we pay so much attention to people of color that the story having to do with European immigrants who were in the 1910s virtually considered an alter, uh, alternative races uh, are an important part of this story. Um, uh, it's consistent with anti-immigration uh, history of the United States. Um, so uh, you, you made a lot of points in this little uh, question. Uh, the distinction, no, they're great. The distinction between strategy. So when we look at what's going on in the final years of the suffrage movement, 1912 to 1920, when the federal government is controlled by a Southern dominated Democratic Party, not much can happen at the national level that uh, deals with racial equality. Not, actually nothing. Black women are shut out entirely. And that's, that's, that's at least a pragmatic decision. On the other hand, if you go to states in those same years, let's say Illinois and New York, where there are, um, where there are uh, Republican parties in particular, uh, that have substantial numbers of African-American voters. Um, uh, African-American women uh, are much more important in those movements. And that's certainly the case in New York, New York City, and in Chicago. Um, on the other hand, um, there is no question that, um, that many, not all, but many of the leaders of the suffrage movement, starting with Elizabeth Stanton and ending with Alice Paul, are, uh, are, um, have, have racial attitudes. I think in Stanton's case, I would call it elitist attitudes because it's not limited to African-Americans. Uh, attitudes about inequality and equality and hierarchy that um, comes into play at moments of tension and stress. It's like their underlying convictions show up when they're pushed to the edge. And that's certainly the case with Stanton. Other questions? Maybe I'll, I'll my, ask my backup question, which is about um, the chronological framing of the movement. Um, and you begin with 1848, but you also describe the more movement as being 75 years old before, I think, 1920. So I'm, I'm curious, Ellen, about the way you think about the chronological framing of the movement, especially in light of um, Lisa Tetro's work in the ways in which suffrage activists in the post-Civil War, War period remade the, the memory of the suffrage movement but also thinking about um, historical figures who were active, who were African-American women, who were active in the abolitionist movement and talking about suffrage at the same time, 1830s or so. So I'm just kind of curious about how you think about the chronology and, and who you decide to foreground in, in telling the story of the suffrage movement. All right, let me answer the last part and then I'll do the first part. I did my best, this is a, a trade book. So I did my best both to um, have the people that people are used to, but not limit that to them. So I do my best to introduce new characters all the way through. Uh, and um, uh, we were talking before we got going on um, the lone, his lone Spanish speaking suffragist in California, uh, Maria de Lopez. I give as much attention to her as I can. There's a woman named Ellis Meredith, who's a very interesting character from Denver. I showed you Elizabeth Ensley from Denver. So I do my best uh, 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 African-American women in the state of Delaware, which uh, Vice President Biden has reminded us actually has quite a large black population. Uh, and um, uh, so I do my best. I can't have a million people because then everybody is like, they close the book and then that's the end of that. So I have to limit myself to en enough people that I can describe them in a way that they are memorable. So that was my decision. Now, the chronology. I'm asking about two different parts. 
sort of why do I pick a point to begin that I could have picked an earlier point and could have picked a later, or no, I pick a later point. No. All right, you said, I say 75 years. And by 75 years, I'm dating it from the beginning of really the women's suffrage focus of the women's rights movement. And um, to put that another way, and that's reconstruction. To put it another way, that's the point at which um, notions, uh, that's the point at which uh, dealing with the status of African American former slave enslaved men, um, we begin to talk about federal suffrage. Prior to that, nobody ever imagines that you're gonna enfranchise people at the federal level. So I start, uh, it's at that point that really the women's rights movement becomes the women's suffrage movement. And that's where I sort of, that's where my 75 years comes in my lecture. I picked 1848 because that's the conventional beginning. And again, it's a trade book. Um, you mentioned people prior to 1848. And um, there's, there's a women's rights movement prior to 1848, but there's not much of a women's suffrage movement before 1848. Um, there's a human rights movement. Uh, there's a movement for um, economic, uh, for uh, married women's property rights. Those are all predate 1848. But 1848, with a few minor exceptions, is the place where the, first of all, where the issue of women's suffrage is introduced and then is maintained consistently from then on. It's not between 1848 and 1866, suffrage is a subcategory of women's rights and other aspects of women's rights get more attention, particularly the economic aspect. It's really only after the Civil War that the suffrage issue rises to the top. Um, I have to say, um, maybe uh, this will get cut out. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Lisa Tetro's work and her criticisms, and I don't really understand them. And um, I'm really not sure what's going on there. I mean, she talks about a master narrative, um, but uh, it's also true um, that uh, uh, the early leaders of the women's suffrage movement um, put together a six volume history of women's suffrage, an incredible set of documents that anybody who takes the time to look into them can go way past some simple narrative of what, you know, the first chapter in the first volume of the history of women's suffrage is called Preceding Causes. And it goes all the way back until the late 18th century. And it's full of a complex set of uh, issues, most importantly, the anti-slavery movement that underlie the women's suffrage movement. So, as I said, I'm not a big fan of that, that um, criticism. I find your work really interesting to think about how historical actors take history making seriously and historical narrative making his, um, seriously. And I just wonder, for example, if you began your work with um, Maria Stewart, if that would change the way that you talk about the suffrage movement. But she wasn't a suffragist. She wasn't a suffragist. She was somebody who was who advocated for uh, uh, equality of women in the African American community, but you couldn't possibly talk about the right to vote in the 1820s. It just for women, it just couldn't happen. So uh, I don't even start with the Grimke sisters, uh, who are um, arguably uh, the first first people to write a women's rights manifesto for the United States, but they don't talk about social equality. They talk about moral equality, um, they talk about human rights, but they do not talk about political equality. A political equality, you know, why 1848? Political equality comes up in 1848 because of what's happening in American politics in general. Um, the, uh, the, accession of half or whatever it is, a third of Mexico uh, has broken open American politics to the point where the uh, agreement of the established parties that they're not going to talk about slavery at all is no longer possible. 
And then we get a series of new political parties, little ones, bigger ones, bigger ones, bigger ones, until we get the Republican Party in 1854, which is able to bring the issue of slavery into American politics and break open the whole story. And it's at that point that Elizabeth Stanton, I think I make this point in the book and I often make it, she was, on the one hand, she's an abolitionist, a fan of William Lloyd Garrison, but her husband and her cousin were leaders of what's called the political abolitionist movement. And she understands from the very beginning that the right to vote is, uh, is the tool without which any, any human goal, I don't remember how she puts it. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about something right now. About a year and a half ago, I heard John Lewis. And um, here's a man who had his head cracked open uh, fighting for voting rights, and he never stopped seeing the importance of voting rights. And I heard him, and I heard him then, and I heard him till the day he died, talking about the importance of voting. And I don't quite know why we as feminists don't see it in the same way. That's my well, answer. Don't you think that voting uh, is just one of our, the, the, the tools in our kit? And um, I'm also thinking about the fact that aside from seeking um, the right to vote that John Lewis um, also was um, pushing John Kennedy to do a Civil Rights Act and um, was also active in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which also had different strategies. So even though that was, that's his public face, maybe we should look more at his historical face yes, in but terms I think... of the multidimensionality. So people's basically, I, I was thinking about how people put their bodies on the line for social movements. And certainly for women's rights, that's been very true. I mean, the, the extreme, of course, was the British suffragists who were, you know, bombing mailboxes and breaking windows and defacing art. But certainly um, people like the National Women's Party were picketing the White House. Um, so, you know, I think that having that dimension of political activism, it may be very discomforting, it may be very uncomfortable, but it's always been a vital part of political movements and social movements. I would never ever disparage civil disobedience. All I would say is that until you have the right to vote, you are really severely limited in doing everything else. Oh, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah, so that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that the vote is our only tool. As long as you are disfranchised, everything else you try to do is profoundly limited. Once you have the right to vote, then you can augment that and go into public with all kinds of other tools. Uh, I certainly don't think getting laws passed is the be all and end all of social change, none of that. Uh, but I think that without the right to vote, um, we are set back, we can't get anywhere as long as we're disfranchised. I think that's what I'm saying. I know Judy has to leave in a moment or three minutes. I have to leave in a few minutes myself. Okay. Um, Ellen, can I kind of piggyback on that and say, and ask um, where do you see, how do you see suffrage fitting into the larger issues of feminism or the, the histories of feminism, history of feminism? I know it's really big. <laughs> well, one of the things I often say, I don't know if this will be a place to start, is um, let's make an analogy between women's suffrage and abortion rights. Um, uh, each of those were demands. <coughs> oh, she sneezed. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, each of those were demands that sort of symbolized women's personhood. Um, they were not, um, I often say this about abortion rights. 
abortion is just one of many tools for reproductive freedom. Um, it is not the be all and end all, but it has come to symbolize women's personhood. And I think you're pretty close to being correct in saying that if um, an active, if somebody is not supporting pro-choice, not the right for, for abortion, but the right to choose abortion, they're not much of a feminist in this world. And I would say that by the early 20th century, you'd have to say the same thing about votes for women. Even our beloved Emma Goldman, who opposed woman suffrage merely for theatrical um, uh, purpose. Um, and you know, when she was an anarchist, but um, mm, I bet you she voted. So uh, <laughs> um, anyhow, so that's the way I think of it, that these are, these are um, issues that stand for a larger set of, I mean, it's very hard to um, go into public with something as amorphous as uh, women's freedom. It, it's, it's very vague. Um, and uh, so um, women's suffrage on the one hand and abortion rights on the other have come to um, be the open door to these larger issues. I'm sure there's more to say about that, but, um, you know, and it is true, I've talked about this in a group that I've been part of, that, um, uh, yeah, I think young women are not as focused, really interesting, not as focused on pro-choice as their mothers and grandmothers are. They're interested in things like um, um, uh, climate change and other uh, carceral state, other things like that. Um, it's probably also true that those young women uh, who came of age right after the right to vote, they, you know, they, they weren't as focused on it. They sort of like, mm, I don't know what that was all about. But um, So feminism, I think of as a kind of horizon that you get there and then the horizon moves away. So if the horizon was suffered, you get there, but the horizon is still moving away. And horizon is uh, uh, the right to have an abortion and you get there and the horizon moves away. So I do not, I'm not one of those people who think we can ever talk about uh, the achievement of women's freedom. Thank you. And thank everybody uh, who participated in the panel. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, I, I, anyhow, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me and uh, letting me go on and on with my ideas.